Uh, my name is Mark Stevenson. I work with the Highlands Ranch Historical Society. And we are here today on Wednesday, January 24th, 2018 at my home in Highlands Ranch, conducting an oral history with you. So tell me a little bit about who you are. Okay, I'm Gary Danny. Uh, I moved out here in 1981. Uh, my brother was a senior executive with Mission Bay of California and moved out here in 78 when they first bought the property to start developing that. With about, uh, Did you move I'm, here at that time? No. Uh, my story is after that, I was in banking back in Michigan, uh, and I came out here on vacation in July of 81, and my brother, they had a... With a pregnant wife. With a pregnant wife. And they had a picnic, the company picnic, was at the mansion, the front, front uh, of the mansion there. And uh, my brother arranged it. I met with a guy by the name of Joe Lamberta and Joe Blake at the picnic, had some beers with him, talked to him. And, uh, and so uh, at the end of the picnic, uh, Joe Blake said, you know, you want to work for us as a as manager of production control. This is July of 81. Nothing was built in the ranch. This yet. was because at that point, Mission built Viejo in addition to building the infrastructure of the community, uh -huh. was also the exclusive home builder. Right. Yeah, Phil Egan was in charge of building. So you're going to be production control, control of what the what I houses? Did. Yeah, primarily? all the building. Now was actually... Uh, even, the had, even the commercial building? Even the commercial. The only commercial building at the time was Northridge School. That was a big, big deal. That was behind schedule, and I was in charge of getting that going. So I was manager of production control. I put the schedule together, how many homes we wanted to sell, and then I met with all the heads of the department every week to see where we're at. Because you had, you know, had to have the uh, uh, the building, uh, you had to have the marketing, you had to have the land development, and all these things had to coordinate. So at the, the certain point in starting the house, you have a piece of land, and you have the guys developing the plans for the house, uh, architectural plans, and they, you know, they want to meet at this point to start building. And then from there on, you follow the schedule, and then you want to sell the homes until you want to make sure the home's done when you sell them. So did, did you have that kind of background? No, I didn't. I was in banking. I was actually a, uh, I was a, uh, uh, in banking for eight years before that, before moving out here. But uh, uh, the only reason I got the job, to be quite honest with you, is probably because of my brother, uh, who said all this up. That's then, okay. At the end of the, at the end of the uh, deal, they offered me a job, and my wife and I stood on the front steps of the mansion. Nothing was built out here yet. It was about eight o'clock at night. The sun was going down. Beautiful sunset. It was in July, and she's pregnant with my daughter. This she is your wife, Carol. 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 She's pregnant with my daughter, Jenny, and she's uh, about uh, probably well, the baby was born in October, so she was six months pregnant. And we sit in front. Of, I had a really good job. I was in banking and being groomed to be president of a bank back in Michigan. And we sat and go, let's move to Colorado. <laughs> so you did. <laughs> we sit in the front steps of the mansion. And so I said, I'm back to Joe Blake and said, yeah, uh, uh, that sounds like a good deal. So when you, you sold your house in Michigan? I sold my house in Michigan. I, I moved out here at the end of the beginning of August to start the job. And where did uh, you live initially? Well, I lived with my brother until my house was done. I was manager of production control, so I had my house done in September. <laughs> and uh, that must have been already underway. Yeah, it, well, it was just ahead. Yeah, it was on the way. It was, they were starting to build up here. But anyway, the uh, my house was done in September. I had my furniture coming from uh, Michigan, and uh, they didn't want an employee to be the first one to close on a ranch and be the first resident on Highlands Ranch because they gave they bought the steer that year. They bought the steer that year from the uh, Douglas County deal. And well, they tell, gave, tell us about that. Well, they cut up the steer and gave it to Scott family, who was the official for his family of Highlands. And right. this was Phil and Kay Scott. Right. And so they got the steer. They didn't want to give that to an employee because they go, wow, how's that going to look? By the way, there's a picture in one of the Heralds here yeah, of okay. the steer. I didn't with, realize that. With the Scots. Yeah, as well. okay. But they got the steer and they got the meat and all that. But uh, what happened is the Scott family. Uh, they were supposed to close. I had my furniture coming in September 27. Now he worked for one of the subcontractors. He did, and actually worked for Tweed Kimball. Scott was a was a wrangler when he was a teenager for Tweed Kimball. He, mm -hmm. he grew up in Sedalia. Very interesting story. But anyway, uh, he worked for the contractors putting the pipes in. But uh, so anyway, my furniture was coming from Michigan on the 27th, and he was supposed to close on the 25th. But someone stole the carpet in his house in his family room. 
and the bank wouldn't let them close because the house wasn't finished. So, so they had to close the home. Right. Exactly. So he yeah. couldn't close. So uh, they ended up, my furniture came, and Mission Vale, my house was all done. Mission Vale said, okay, you can move in with your furniture, but I mean, we can't let you close. So I actually moved in my house about three or four days before Scott, and then mm-hmm. I closed about three days after Scott closed in my house. It's kind of a funny story. But so, uh, <clears throat> you also have the claim with you and your wife of having the first child born. In yeah, that was the first baby born in Ireland's ranch. In Ireland's ranch. She was yeah. born on October 18th. You, October 18th. 1981. Well, you were on a fast track. Yeah, on a fast track. She was early. She was two weeks early, and I worked for Mission Vale Company at the time. And I'm not sure if you know, Jim Tepford, his daughter, had the second baby. She was three days the Willett family. This was Diane? No. Uh, 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 Katie, uh, what was his daughter's name? His wife. It was Katie Willett, who was the, the baby born, mm-hmm. Scott and uh, oh, the Willets. Uh, anyway, they were born three days after Jennifer, and she was late. And Jim Tepper walked into my office uh, probably, probably a couple days after. He said, give me a stern look like this. He said, you beat me. And I thought, boy, I'm in trouble with this guy because he could really handle really, I didn't know him that well, you know. And he's president of the company. I'm just a little guy type of guy. And then he started laughing. Well, you, you beat me. First baby born in the ranch. Okay. Well, let's talk about the first office that the mission people had that you knew about. Where well, was it? Oh, well, it was in Inverness. On the Inverness golf course, uh, there was an office over there. and I, I could look right out my office over there at the time and uh, look at the golf course. And well, how many employees were there at the time? I venture a couple of hundred, you know, the builders and all that. Sil Egan was in charge of building at the time. And they had a couple of hundred people going. You know, we had a, when I took over, when I was doing production control type of deal, where I was putting numbers together for Mission Vale, Philip Morris, we called it Red Book. Uh, numbers, we had our projection, we had Red Book. Red Book was supposed to be conservative. And we're telling Mission Vale we're going to do 1,300 to 1,000. That was the Red Book. That was a conservative number. And our number was 1,700 homes a year. So they, they had to staff up for that. And that's what they thought they were going to do. Then the economy went bad, and we only did 300 homes the first year. <laughs> Gary, explain the relationship with Mission Viejo and Philip Morris. Well, Philip Morris actually bought Mission Viejo Company back in 1973. And Jim Teffer is a part of that. He was uh, well, one of the principals, and they got Philip Morris stock. Uh, Mission Viejo started in the mid '60s in California. Right, exactly. And they were the biggest, uh, one of the biggest mover of dirt in the United States at the time. They, it was a big deal out there, and it was very nice. They did a beautiful job in developing that. And Jack Robb was the uh, was the engineer, and Jack Robb came out here too. But anyway, uh, Philip Morris bought them in '73, and. Uh, uh, they got their foot wet out here in Aurora in 73 or 74. They actually started a development in Aurora over there to see how they like Colorado. And then in 1978, and I won't go into that story because it's been told many times, uh, Mission Viejo uh, bought uh, the Phelps Ranch here and started developing it mm-hmm. and from Marvin Davis, who I used to work for. When I left Mission Viejo Company and went back into banking, I worked for Marvin Davis. So when was that? I left in 82. In late 80s? Late eight, no, I left in 82 yet. Uh, the handwriting was on the wall. They didn't need as many people as they needed out here. And because so, of the recession? The recession, yeah. They weren't selling near as many homes they were planning I on. So I just, they called me up one day at a, a banking group and said, Do you want to work at Metro National Bank? I went down there and interviewed. And I talked. I can, uh, so I said, hey, That's a good idea. Because I said, and short lived. And I, actually, they had a layoff of a bunch of people about four months after I left. Uh, they had a big layoff. They just weren't building that many homes. The layoff here at Mission Yeah, Mission Bay had come in and had a big mm-hmm. layoff. So anyway, that was the story. That well, was that's the history of Colorado. It's an up or down type oh, state. And that, and that, and that recession Over lasted bus. from about 82 uh, until, if you bought a house here in 1982, 83, you didn't get that price back on your house until about 1992. They went down in value right after that. I can remember a lot so about the oil industry in oh, particular, yeah. that it <clears throat> was very go-go in the late 70s, uh-huh. and they were pushing everyone's uh, salaries up in mm-hmm. competition for their hiring things, and then in the early 80s, it crashed. Yeah, well, the prices and went down. through the mid-80s, no, it yeah, well, it was crashed really, significantly. It was really bad. All the banks went out of the business. All you had color national banks. So you had guys like Hickenlooper who 
used to be in oil and gas business, form his um, brew pub. Yeah, and all these, uh, a lot of the engineers. They found other uh, careers. The only reason the Highlands Ranch even sold as many homes as they did is Mark Marietta was hiring. And so I bet you 30% of the homes, maybe even higher, of the homes in Highlands Ranch were Martin Marietta, Martin Marietta employees. Yeah. Uh, there was no other, there weren't any oil engineers or anything like that moving which, in here. Which eventually uh, became Lockheed. Lockheed, right, exactly. Yeah. So that was their only reason the ranch sold any home, but they weren't selling near as many homes as they wanted to. That's so. good. Well, let's transition into one of the first major activities that might have come from the influence of Mission Viejo in California. You and others moved in in the late summer, early fall of 81. Mm -hmm. And I understand that, like at Mission Viejo in California, an activities committee was organized. Right. right. Tell me about that. Well, in October of 81, uh, late October, our cook came and said, let's start an activities committee. And I knew our cook really well because I worked with him. And so I was one of the first guys he talked to. So I talked to my neighbors and I talked to a bunch of people. What was Art's responsibility at that point? Art was a uh, ranch and and his, he was in charge of the activities committee from day one until they left in around 1990, somewhere around in that. Uh, that was a big deal. That was his big deal. We we're always working on events. We had tons of events going on to bring that community together. It's community spirit and they were fun deals. But we, the first meeting we probably had about no, 20 people there, and the first meeting was to uh, set up Santa's arrival. Uh, and actually, Santa's arrival was the Sunday after Thanksgiving. It was always that day in 1981. And so that was modern, modeled after what had happened in California. Right, modeled after what happened in California. Mm -hmm. Santa's arrival. What happened is all the homeowners decorated all the lights on the streets. Broadway. We only had Broadway on the streets. We only had Broadway with the big tall trees on it. We got out there and cold. I still remember, very cold. And we decorated all those trees, got up on 14-foot ladders and put bulbs all over. And we had tons. Mission Bay paid for everything. You know, we, had, we money was not an option. We, it was just a help type of deal. So we put that all together. My neighbor and his pictures in here, Tom Brennan, uh, we built the first mailbox. And they still use that mailbox today. I saw it out there this this year next to Santa's house. We put a mailbox. We built a mailbox. And letters, to, letters to Santa. Letters to Santa. My kids, and they're all the kids here. And there was a lady here, uh, Chris Valenti, was a very good friend of mine, still a good friend of mine today. She lived here in the ranch. And she knew these kids. So the kids would put the letters in there, and then she'd write back. Mm -hmm. And say, yeah, uh, Santa realized that you lost your tooth last month, and you know you, you know, you're not feeling too good, or you, know, you broke your leg during the time. And the kids are going crazy because they got these letters from Santa, and they said, "How does Santa Claus know all that?" So what happened is we did all this work, we put it all together, the activities committee, and then we had Santa's arrival came in in a fire truck, and, and Art Cook got on his two-way telephone talking to Santa and directed them here to Highlands Ranch, and you're almost here, Santa. Oh, you're lost. We're going to turn the lights on for you so you can see where you're going, and we turned all the lights on, and the kids went crazy. We're singing songs at the same time. Well, kids just the, went crazy. How big the community that well, first we probably had maybe season? 60 people out there for the first hand of the rifle. Uh, I think they, uh, at that time, uh, they probably had about 30 pounds sold uh, at most. Yeah, but everybody, 90% of the people, maybe 95% of the people that lived here at the time were out there at that ceremony. And boy, what a feeling. And then the kids are going crazy. And uh, so we turn on the lights, and then Santa Claus, the fire truck starts going and turns the corner, and the kids. So it was a neat event. Backing up just a little bit, do you have any recollection of activities at Thanksgiving? Oh yeah, what happened is Mary Putnam, who was a neighbor of mine, and she was in charge of activities and rec centers and everything at Highlands Ranch. And she had come from, from California, Diego, California, California. California, and she was a friend of mine, a very good friend of mine. Right? She was like a sister to me for many, many years, but she was a neighbor of mine. And uh, Anyway, uh, where was I going with this story? Well, I was asking about Thanksgiving. Oh, well, Thanksgiving. Days. Okay, Thanksgiving. Mary Putnam, Art Cook, Jeff Capis, uh, all dressed up. And Mary Putnam was the pilgrim, the lady, and in the ticket. Uh, Jeff Capis and Art Cook. Art Cook was a turkey, if I'm not mistaken. And Jeff Capis was uh, dressed up in some kind of 
Puritan outfit too, and they went to, I think they had 35 homes in the ranch, and they gave a, a Christmas turkey to everybody in the ranch. <laughs> they knocked on the door, there was Murray putting them with her, they got a picture of it in here, as a matter of fact, in the yeah. Highlands Ranch Reporter, which is really neat. And they gave, gave her the turkey. You were a homeowner then. Oh, well, was really neat. I mean, you, the feeling you had in living in Highlands Ranch in the beginning was unbelievable. I drove the other side of County Line Road, and they just had a little road in front of Wilmore. The Broadway wasn't done yet. They had a little asphalt road off the of County Line. Nothing out here at all. There was a, a family of antelope, if you can believe it, right on the corner of Broadway and County Line that you drove by. And I drive down uh, County Line Road, and they had night the sun was going down. I saw all these off the of County Line Road, all these cattle. And you see the silhouette of the cattle. Then you drive in the ranch, and it's, left, it's like you left the world behind you. You're driving into your private ranch. That's the feeling you got. Everybody knew each other, everybody cared for each other. It was just a fun deal. And you drove in the Highlands Ranch and you had your own little world. It was like just driving like the Twilight Zone. You're driving down the road and all of a sudden you're in your own little ranch in the middle of Denver, you know, not in the middle of Denver at, at the time where there was nothing out here. But it was a neat feeling. Well, the first intersection, as I understand it, was Broadway and County line. No, they, Clark, they, they didn't build, Broadway didn't go in and University didn't go in until they built C-470, which was in 87. There was a little road right in front of Wilmore, and there was a picture in here, there was a post office off that little road when you first came in, and a medical, uh, Mercy Medical, that mm -hmm. little building there. In fact, I cut my hand one time, I had to go over there. But there's just a little two-lane road, with no stop, white or anything like that. You can, uh, that's the only way to get in and out of the ranch. It's right in front of Wilmore. That road's long gone now. Long before C-470 yeah. was built. So for many years, he had to go off the county line road, off that little road uh, that they had, just a little surface road. And that was called Ranch Road? I couldn't remember. I don't think. I've I seen remember. some activities that have referred to it, it as could Ranch be, Road. It could be Ranch. I don't know the name of it. I'm not even sure it had a name. Ranch Road right now is the road that they put to go to Highlands Ranch Mansion, sure. Sure. which was they put that road in. And like it was like, Actually, they put uh, gravel down. We had a big event out there. I'm, I always get off on tangents here, so maybe I shouldn't do that. Go ahead. So, well, what happened there in 1984, we used to have New Year's Eve parties up there every year, too. Starting when? Oh, well, starting the first year. We had first New Year's year. Eve, yeah. Mm -hmm. They let us do New Year's. We had parties up there all the time. The mansion was like a second home. Uh, so we had a party up there. But one year, we had a party of like 83. We used to park the cars. And uh, well, in the very first year, uh, in order to get to the ranch, the mansion, you had to go down by Colorado Boulevard down there, take a uh, dirt road, probably Daniels Road at the time, went into County Line, and you went down, you drove down about a quarter mile, and you had to open up a gate to go into the pasture for the cows and drive down this dirt road that goes over, and they had uh, gate rails over the uh, streams and all that, and you had to honk your horn at the cattle to get the cattle off the road to get to the mansion. They didn't put the road from the, the ranch road in until about 1986. So that was, they had to take this long way around to get back and drive actually through the cattle pasture <laughs> to get to the, uh, for all our parties. But it was a lot of fun. But so back in the day, we had a big uh, snowstorm the night we had our New Year's Eve party. Uh, I'm thinking around 84, somewhere around in there. And we parked cars at Northridge and we had our cook Suburban, we rented a couple Suburbans to take people back and forth, and the Suburbans got stuck, and we just had a, we just had a real mess. So that summer, uh, Highlands Ranch uh, Mission Bale Company put in a uh, uh, gravel road, uh, just gravel, going up to the mansion so we didn't have to go through the pasture and all that. That's kind of neat. Yeah. Jim Tepper at one point had talked about when they got to possession of the mansion at one point, he remembers distinctly the, the front lawn of the mansion that's now very manicured yeah. was weeds up <laughs> here and cattle grazing in the front yard. Oh yeah, no other big deal. Because that was a pasture yeah, at that point. Beat up tennis court next yeah. to it and all that. Yeah, yeah. Beat, up, beat up tennis court too. Yeah, mm -hmm. they did. Uh, that kind of went away when they did the remodel in 2000. 11, yeah, they redid that whole thing. Yeah, they did. But, but uh, that's it was, not surprising. It was old. It was yeah. old. But we, Mission Viejo, that was our second home. We had parties up there all the time. Commission, that was part of their deal. We had, uh, well, we had Santa's arrival, and then uh, we had the New Year's Eve party. Uh, the other parties we had, we the activities committee uh, put on. Uh, the first couple of years, they had a roundup where they rounded up the cattle and actually uh, 
vaccinated them and uh, branded them and all that. They only last a couple years. This was in May. What's that? This was in May. Right. They call, we call it the Roundup. Mm -hmm. We only did it two years because the smell and the kids, even my children, said, wow, what's going on here? I always remember uh, the guy from uh, uh, whose dad uh, was in charge of uh, uh, Mission Viejo. He was the senior vice president. He started Miller Beer. Uh, anyway, he uh, his son was out here. He's telling me, he said, why? We're going to have Rocky Mountain Oysters tonight. I had no idea it was Rocky Mountain Oysters. <laughs> well, at, at one point, um, Donna Root with the finance department, did yeah. you know her later on? Well, I actually knew her in the beginning. My brother, Donna Root, and her husband, Steve Root. Steve Root, at the very beginning, Steve Root was in charge of their controller in charge of the accounting, and my brother was in charge of marketing. So my brother and Steve Rood had offices together since 1978, and we used to play uh, uh, sports trivia. Steve Rood, myself, uh, uh, who was it? Uh, Jim Crager, he was, a, he was the CFO. We used to get together once a week, every once every two weeks, and play uh, sports trivia. So Steve was a very good friend. He died unexpectedly lung cancer. But uh, Donna's still a good friend. I still see her every once in a while. Well, Donna um, helped interview Jim Teffer a few oh, years okay. ago. Yeah. And she brought with her um, a CD called uh, Highlands Ranch, My Hometown. Oh, okay. With about 425 pictures. Oh, wow. From the very earliest days, building infrastructure yeah. and everyone, and through the, through the mid-'80s. And what was notable was all the pictures from parties that were held at the mansion. Uh-huh. Because it was very evident that there was um, a Miller beer connection oh, yeah, and there was a Marlboro yeah. cigarette com commercial. Well, because of these pictures, everyone seemed to have a beer can in their hand. Yeah, and we had all beer. Light or whatever. Our cook had a cooler in the back of the Suburban, yeah. always loaded with beer. And we'd have our yeah. activities committee. We probably met almost every week, every two weeks. And we go out to our cook's truck and bring in the cooler full of Miller beer. We got all the Miller beer we wanted. We used, yeah. In the back of the mansion, there's a little room when you came into the back door before they redid it. There was a parking lot back there, dirt and all that. And that room was full of Miller, Miller beer. But the kind of a story on the cigarettes back in 1982 was the first uh, uh, July 4th celebration. We had a party in the front of the mansion again. And uh, uh, we did barbecue beef. We wrapped the beef up in aluminum foil. Mary Putnam was in charge of it, and our cook. So we'd wrap beef, I, I had the smell in my hand. We'd, we'd put rub all over it, wrapped in aluminum foil, put a wire on it. We had a six foot pit in the back, we put a quart of wood in. Then we burnt it, and then at night, mm -hmm. we put the night before, we put the barbecue in there with the wire. And the sand, we sat back there all night for the fire department, so we had to do that. And we put sand over the, uh, the curated uh, right. uh, metal. And then, you know, next day, about 11, 12 o'clock, we take that beef out and slice it up and serve it to people with barbecue with the rolls. And that was a great deal because we always had twice as much as we wanted. So the people that worked on the event took it home with them. So I'd take a big brisket of beef home with me. And uh, <laughs> my family loved it. It was really great stuff. But, yeah, we did the brisket. But uh, that was all paid for. Mission Vail paid for all those events. and that, But we did that. The barbecue was a trademark. We did that for every event. We uh, we had barbecue. Uh, we yeah. and I can't tell you how many times I wrapped barbecue on them in foil, uh, and, the, and we did it in the kitchen of the mansion. But getting back to cigarettes, we had a July Fourth celebration, and Mission Vale put these little packs of cigarettes, four packs of cigarettes, at everybody's tables. We had all kind of children out there. The we lady. saw we saw some pictures. Yeah, it's yeah. pretty obvious that there were marble <laughs> cigarettes on the lady. table and Miller beers and yeah. cans. There the lady Kim Herskovitz. She was real active. She started the PTA here in Highlands mm -hmm. Ranch. Her children were the first children in the Northridge School. She moved in about three weeks after we did. She would live down the street. Boy, she went to Mission Viejo Company on Monday and just reamed them. She said. Cigarettes with children? What are you guys thinking about? And they only put the cigarettes out one time. <laughs> but they actually had packs of cigarettes all over the place. I mean, cigarettes on every table, you know, where you're eating, and they had packs of cigarettes. But so we had, we got all the Miller beer we wanted. Uh, like um, Philip Morris bought, uh, like L I K E, uh, Coca Cola, uh, and Seven Up. 
And so that's all you had at all our events was all those frogs and they got them off. This was an outdoor only activity, wasn't it? What's that? The July, the July 4th. July event? Yeah, on July 4th, we did a bike parade, our very first bike parade. My son was in a oh, I mean, you weren't inside the mansion. Well, we used to go inside the mansion for all kinds of stuff, yeah. But uh, the mansion, the different parties we had over the years was, uh, we had July 4th, which consisted of uh, a dunk tank and all that kind of stuff at Northridge behind the Northridge Rex and the so parking got, lot. who got dumped? Well, we used to have Steve Zotos was one of them. Our cook was definitely in there every year. Mm -hmm. And we had a little... Uh, pony rides for kids, so that was part of the July. We started off with the parade. The parade the first year had something like 30 little bikes dressed up. I think bike parade. Bike parade. Yeah. And we said, well, we have to do a parade. We don't have anything going on. So our cook and I, I was in charge of that event. I was chair of the uh, July 82, 4th of July. Mm -hmm. And I used to go to July celebration. I said, let's do all this stuff. You know, So we did it all. We brought in vendors and stuff like that, but throw the ball and different things and knock down bottles and we had all that stuff going on. And so, uh, but our cook was in the dunk tank. He was one of the people, on, everybody lined up to dunk him in. And uh, I'll so Zotus you. came out, he was in the dunk tank. I'll tell you a story that Zotus told us. In one of those years, Zotus is uh, enlisted to be a judge of the kids' bike parade. Oh, okay. So he's never done this before, but he's having fun doing the thing, except toward the end, where whoever won the thing, it was not won by uh, a child whose mother was irate of why her child <laughs> did not win the bike award. And she just laid into him. Yeah. And after that, he said, I don't need this grief. I'm not doing this again just for being a judge. Are you kidding me? Yeah. I don't need this level of grief. He was a dunk tank, too. He was a really good guy. He really did a lot for the community. He was really a personal type of guy. So yeah. where did your activities committee get all their ideas? Well, we did. It was just I read cook. through enough of the Heralds, and yeah. it seemed like... Well, our cook had some. Our there were cook, lots. Yeah, we, what we did, we had uh, Santa's arrival. Then we had New Year's Eve party. Uh, then we had the Easter egg hunt that was put on the Mary Putnam. The first Easter egg hunt, we probably didn't have more than 15 kids out there. Uh, then uh, we had the July 4th celebration, which was really nice. We had a bunch of stuff going on for that. We always had barbecue, you know, for the July Again, 4th. Again, that was at the mansion. Yeah, not well, we did it. Where was we, the Easter egg hunt? We had, the Easter egg hunt was in Northridge Park. All, everything happened in Northridge, if it didn't happen at the mansion, the only two places we had. And then uh, uh, at the mansion, and then we had Highlands Ranch Days, and the Highlands Ranch Days are really fun. We did sports activities, but the biggest fun part of and we did it for many, many years, we started in 82. We cleaned out of the barns, and we had a hoedown, mm -hmm. and uh, all the beer you could drink, and people were just annihilated when they were done. <laughs> Everything was, was this free. part of Highlands Ranch Days? It was Highlands Ranch Days. Families. That was a big deal for Highlands Ranch yeah. Days. We had a Saturday night. Saturday we did baseball games and we had stuff with uh, uh, roping cattle and kind of stuff like that for the kids. And then Saturday night. So this night, was the first fall, 1982. In 82, we cleaned out. That the, was the first Highlands Ranch Days. That was the first yeah, Highlands you Ranch Days. You know, that still held in... September. No, no, they still, all the events they have going on today, yeah. we, the Activities Committee uh, turned everything over to the HRCA in 1992. But for the first 10 years, of the, we put them all on, all volunteer work. We had a really good group of people, and we all had fun doing it, too. Yeah. We put, you know, we the had, committee got bit bigger over the years? Yeah, we always had. It started off with about 20. It probably never got bigger than about 30, 35 type of deal. It was the same thing. I worked every event. From October of '81 at the first meeting till we turned it over in '92, I worked every event. Well, that's what I call dedicated well, volunteer. And then another. Well, you did it for the community. The fun the children had. These events really brought the community together. You know, July Fourth we had the fireworks. Mission Bay paid for all the fireworks. We had a band. They paid for a band out there. We had it in Northridge. Did you do the fireworks in Northridge also? Yeah, we did. We, in 82, we did fireworks, and we moved them in 85, I think, or 86, somewhere around there, because of real dry, and we start, we caught five Stony Point homes on fire, because they had the wooden Ooh, roof, so shaped roofs, yeah. and we had, the, and I'm out there, our cook, we had the fire deals out there, our cook and I, and we started some fires out there, it was real dry, and uh, started fires in the field right behind Northridge Park back there, and a couple of homes got caught on fire, so the fire department said, 
no more fireworks here, and that was it. But we had them right there. Uh, we'd have a band right at the, the, the little carousel there. We have a band in there, and every year we uh, we raffled off the uh, cow. They have pieces of meat wrapped up in paper, and you bought raffle tickets. We raffled all these off, and kind of a funny story there. Uh, I learned a trick one time. If you could bend your ticket, you have a better chance of being picked. Hmm. And so all of a sudden, I'm at this event. I bought tons of tickets. I bent them all up before I put them in, and Art Cook's reading off the numbers. And, and, uh, he, and I've already got like 10 pieces of meat, and uh, Art Cook's pulls out the ticket. He says, this must be Gary Danny has bent. <laughs> Good. Yeah. Okay, Art. Yeah, you've been you've been hit. <laughs> so the activities committee, we put on the Highlands Ranch days. Uh, we put on uh, uh, Halloween. We decorated the mansion so the kids could walk through. And that night we had a party. Uh, the party was always held. The parties are always held in the white room of the mansion in the back with all the tile and that. Toilets are always plugging up. They had a terrible toilet problem there when we had our parties. So they, we had still, a, they still do. And for many years, now they got the big bathroom, obviously. Yeah. That, that was a big difference. But uh, for many years, we had those parties every year. Mm -hmm. uh, which are really fun deals. We actually, the cow barn they have there, uh, we had it in the, we had it in the uh, one of the barns on the wooden floor. We opened up the two doors at the end. It was the first year. It was just great. We had such a great time. But we took it all. We had to go and clean it all out. So a bunch of us and actually uh, Michael Cook, who used to be one of our county commissioners, the first time I met her was doing that event. She came out here with her kids and we were cleaning out the barn with her husband and that. And, but they put the hay out and that night they had a storm come in. The hay got wet and ruined it. So we used a milking barn. In the first couple of years, the milking barn was just a dirt floor. And then we were having so much fun with this. It was an annual event to do the uh, hoedown uh, that Mission Dale came in and paved the milking barn. So we had a paved floor to do it. But we did for first 10 years we had a hoedown every year. We had a collar and we had all the free beer and all that stuff. Just a fun deal. It was really fun. You know, they have reinstituted a Halloween activity at the mansion uh, for the last two years. Yeah. That's so a lot it's, of it. Though it's an outdoor activity. Yeah. You know, they well, have no, you some can't. decorations indoors. Yeah. But for the most part, well, we got a it's coffin. an outdoor activity. We got a coffin one time. We had to, you know, you have to remember, there was hardly any kids here. And, it was like a country club, I told people. We had this big North, they had the rec center at Northridge, and they could never get kids to go to the events. So they actually call us up on the phone and say, hey, we got an event, bring your kids over. And that's how it was back then. It was just like, like a country club. Good. Let's talk about the rec center. Okay. When was the rec center um, initially built? Well, the rec center was here when the first two residents moved in. That was a promise. There's two things, and I was in, uh, I worked on both those projects when I was manager of production control. One, they said they're going to be a rec center, and that was built, but it was very small. I'm not sure if you know the original rec center only had a little room when you came in, a little the office, uh, the swimming pools, and three tennis courts. Then later on, they added the gymnasium and everything else. Yeah, and I was president of the Wilmore Association when we did that back in 1983, 84. So the rec center was here in the beginning, and Northridge School opened up uh, right in the beginning. Uh, that was one of your projects. Well, it was behind schedule on manager production control. So we, yep. uh, the principal uh, of the school, uh, and myself were moving desk in. That was McFarland? Yeah. <laughs> moving desk in when uh, people were actually painting because they were so far behind schedule on it. But the rec center was here to begin with, and then. Uh, uh, and then I, and back in 83, I was a delegate in 83 for district number two. Now they got 120 districts, if I'm not mistaken. But uh, the Mission Vail came to me, and they came to me with a lot of stuff for the homeowners because I knew them. And so they said, well, hey, we want to build it in addition to the rec center. You want to spearhead that. So I said, okay. So me, and there was two of us. There was three delegates at the time, but one never came. Me and a lady by the name of Pam Allen. And so we sent out a brochure to everybody, what you want in the rec center, a letter and all that. And it came back. We went to Mission Video Company. I sat down with Joe Blake. We put the financial package together. We put a limit on you couldn't raise our dues more than a certain dollar amount because some rec centers are failing. The homeowners are stuck with these big bills. So we put a really nice package that protected the homeowners. And we put in a big swimming pool, the indoor swimming pool, the gymnasium, and all that stuff uh, went in. And Mission Bayo gave us uh, uh, 
I think it was $8 million towards it. And then we picked up a tab of about $3 million to homeowners on a loan. Uh, so it was, and at the time, we started it, we started building, and actually for our fifth year reunion, which was October of 1986, we had the ribbon cutting. And my daughter, she was always invited to ribbon cuttings and the parades and all that, being the first baby. So she should be about so, five years old then. She was five years old, exactly. And so my daughter cut the ribbon mm -hmm. uh, for that in October of 86. Beautiful rec center. It was rated as the best public rec center in the United States at the time. Very nice. We had a high diving board in there, which is long gone now. Because even when I was still... Uh, Inside uh, or outside? Uh, in, uh, indoor. 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 indoor mm -hmm. High diving board. When I was... Uh, Still uh, on the board of directors of Highlands Ranch, and the board of directors back then was uh, uh, five board of directors. Three were from Mission Vale Company because they controlled everything, which is right. And then two outside, and so Pam Hill and myself were the two outside uh, board members that put the rec center together. But they really listened to us. We used, I used to meet with Joe Blake, uh, oh, once every two weeks, once every three weeks, we'd have lunch and that together, putting plans together. What was Joe together. Blake's responsibility at that point? He was a senior vice president in charge of probably the, the overall chemistry of the ranch, I'd say. Uh, Well-respected man. And uh, he, he was the guy that brought everything together. He knew all of it. He was a political guy when everything, when Arapahoe College wanted to do something or whatever, Joe Blake was the guy. He was just politically connected and got Mission Gale recognized, I would say. He was probably, he's got his name all over everything at Highlands Ranch. And, uh, even when we, uh, back in 1982, I think it was, maybe 83, they had a bond election. And Joe Blake worked with it, and he came to me and said, we need to do something with the community. We have to have that bond passed. $135 million bond to build schools. Without that, because I'm not sure you knew it or not, but uh, Mission Gale paid for Northridge, $10 million. Dollars. And then uh, for 10 years, they paid their been, operational costs for 10 years. And then when that 10 years was over, um, they didn't have to, but they gave the money. We built some in elementary school. Uh, but the Mission Vale paid for but they had a $135 million bond election coming up for schools, capital improvements. He said, well, we got to get people out from Highlands Ranch. But the rest of Douglas County hated Highlands Ranch. Why is that? Well, we're just a drain on them. You know, they didn't want to pay taxes and build schools for us. And they're living out there. They hated us. Uh, I'm not sure who hated us. So well, they, were, they, they, didn't want, they didn't want to support our growth. There's, you know, here's a company, Mission Gale Company, Philip Morris, and they're going to have to put money towards our schools. It just didn't seem right to them. But anyway, so we put a phone tree together, me and a, a lady by the name of Kim Herskovitz. And we were advisors to the school board at the time. And uh, anyway... We got probably 90% of the people from Highlands Ranch to vote on that bond election, and it passed by 20 votes. And so all of a sudden, we got $120 million, $135 million to build schools. So that's how we built Highlands Ranch High School, Crest Hill, and we built five elementary schools in Highlands Ranch out of that money. Good. But it's just a matter of getting the people. But Joe Blake, that was his reason, getting all this stuff put together. Gary, tell me a little bit about the housing options when you moved in. I understand there were... Three different groups. Yeah, you know, the first, uh, first two groups were Bayfield, which was, uh, I don't know if you're familiar with Dad Clark, it started Dad Clark and went to right uh, the uh, street right before the Northridge Rec Center, that was Bayfield. Uh, then they had Stony Point, that was, not, excuse me, Stony Point was uh, east of the Rec Center, Northridge. And then they had the Groves, which was uh, that would be south, excuse me. The growth south would be of south of the North Ridge Rec Center. The Rec Center and three actually. And the first homes were actually in Bayfield. Uh, Bayfield had the first homes in them, and along with the growth. They opened up just about the same time. All those started coming on uh, for sale, and they closed on them. The uh, Stony Point was a couple months later. They, I think the first house in Stony Point was towards the end of November, maybe the beginning of November somewhere. This so is 1981. 1981. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And so the price of the homes kind of give you an idea. The growth is going for right around 85000 for the base house. Uh, the base house in, uh, uh, in uh, the uh, Bayfield area, uh, it started off right around probably around 92000 The most expensive was 99000 uh, That was the White Hall. That's the house I ended up buying. Uh, and then they had the Stony Point, and they were about 110000 somewhere around in there. Uh, for a Stony Point house. How do those prices compare to 
other houses available in the area? Oh, they're competitive because I was looking at writer homes over there, and they're competitive. What you got uh, when they first opened up the interest rates in homes in 1981, if you could get a fixed rate loan on a house, it's unbelievable. It was 19 percent. Wow! <laughs> you can't wow. buy much home at 19 percent. You know. Yeah. So uh, Mission Viejo bought down with Citicorp Bank the loan. So the first owners of homes in Highlands Ranch actually got a 12 and three quarter percent loan, which was a deal at the time. Highly subsidized. Yeah, they had to pay. They bought it down, so they bought. So the very first, they couldn't sell any homes otherwise. And if you bought a home, you couldn't even get a fixed rate loan. Everything was a three year arm. You'd have to pay 18 percent for a three year arm. The prime rate at the time was over 22 percent, and it kind of give you an idea how the economy was. And that's why they, you couldn't sell a home. Uh, to qualify for a hundred thousand dollar home, even in the today's market at eighteen percent interest rate, you can only buy one third of the house that you normally could buy at a four percent or five percent interest rate at eighteen percent. That's how bad the market was. So the interest rates were just killing the sales of Highlands Ranch. So they bought down the mortgage, and then the first homes of Highlands Ranch had a lien. Uh, Joe Blake had to work out a deal with the title company, Land Title, because uh, the loss there was a lawsuit that the Phipps family sold the land too cheap. To Marvin Davis, because Marvin Davis, and I won't go into the numbers on that, but he made a ton of money on. on Her understanding was is that the the family sold for twelve, thirteen million, and Marvin Davis sold it to Mission Viejo for twenty three million. Now thirty two, and I think it was eighteen million. And Marvin Davis, he didn't even have to put in money; he just had a contingency to buy the property, and at the closing. He, he walked away, I think it was $18 million profit. Yeah, we, we, heard, we heard that. The story we heard was he doubled his money in yeah, two years. Yeah, he didn't even have to put any money down. He just had a contingency on the property. Yeah. But anyway, there was a lawsuit by the Phibbs family. So the very first homeowners of Highlands Ranch had a lawsuit, and that lasted about two years until that was finally settled. How did the that get the result? They had to put up a bond in case anything happened. Uh, and if the, if the Phibbs family won that lawsuit, Mission Gale put up a bond to protect the title company. But they were sure they're going to win it. So, but they, in order to get title, they got to do a special arrangement. Mission, Mission Bay will put that together. So, the first homes are very nice. Uh, uh, and uh, uh, my first home was right on Broadway. I looked over Broadway. I could see Long's Peak, the Pikes Peak, out to my backyard. Uh, and you had a developing family. How many bedrooms? It was a, it was a three bedroom. Um, and four yeah. bedroom, excuse me, a four bedroom home. In your development, what was the range of bedrooms at those price points? Well, most of the things are three or four bedrooms. Three or four. The, the groves are mostly three bedroom. They're smaller homes. Mm -hmm. Tri levels were popular. I didn't like them yeah. at the time. We had a two level. You remember the square footages? Yeah, my home was uh, two thousand two hundred square feet, and mm -hmm. I had the biggest. So level. pretty good size. Yeah, and all yeah. homes in were uh, the Stony Points were going for about two thousand five hundred square feet, maybe two thousand six hundred square feet, and the groves are probably around a thousand eight hundred square feet, somewhere around in there. Yeah. And so that was the pricing of them back then. You, uh, if you had lot, the lot premium on Broadway, I paid a $500 lot premium to be on the back of Broadway. At the time, it was beautiful. C470 wasn't in or anything along that line. The view was just spectacular. Nothing was built out here yet. And the view of the mountains, they, you know, uh, it was really something. Yeah, well, things changed. Yeah, they did change. Things, things they did up. change. Uh, at some point, the community decided to build the convenience center on after Broadway was extended further south on the west side of Broadway. Yeah, 7 Eleven, you're talking about the 7 Eleven? 7 Eleven? Yeah, 7 Eleven was the first the commercial building. building. The commercial buildings, too. Yeah, the commercial bank, the, the bank building where Wells Fargo didn't come in until a few years later. They just mm -hmm. had that small little shopping center. There was a conical gas station there with a little place to put your oil when you change your oil. So I used to walk out the back of my house, take my oil down there and put it in that deal. 7-Eleven was a big deal. Uh, there's a restaurant there where the 7-Eleven was. Uh, stories told when 7-Eleven finally closed, they never made any money on that. Initially, with the boom that was supposed to happen, the Highlands Ranch was supposed to have a big grocery store come in. Uh, that never happened. Uh, so 7-Eleven was the only store. Then uh, the first grocery store, we had to use, used to have to go to uh, King Super's over there at University and uh, uh, Dry Creek by Arapahoe High School. Uh, that was, and the only gas, the closest gas station was uh, down there at Broadway, the other side of the Arapahoe Road. Though they had the one, the Conical there too. Uh, but that was that shopping center. And then uh, I think it was about five years later, they built the Wells Fargo Bank Building. Uh, and that right. 
And then the other first... There's early library there, too. And it? then the other first development, they had La Petite. It was a, a little school for children. Mm -hmm. uh, and that's by where the Metro District building is now. There like wasn't a, a Metro like a daycare? District. The daycare center there it was yeah. called La Petite. My children went to that. So that's the only buildings at the ranch at the time, commercial buildings, mm -hmm. was that uh, convenience center. Further down on Broadway, when did the churches get added? Uh, churches didn't get added until uh, probably around 84, 85, somewhere around in there. So there the, was Christ Lutheran and, and there was Methodist, Methodist Church. church right, those two churches got added. Uh, eventually got added. Yeah, so they got in. Uh, what was the typical profile of one of the first homeowners who bought into either of the three neighborhoods? Well, it was a small family, young children. We didn't have a high school or a junior high school out here yet. And the people that moved in, I did have, I have a very good friend. They still live out here today. Their son, they moved in in 83, but their son had to be uh, bused to Castle Rock every day to go to school. So it was a big deal. I was going to ask you so if they most, had older kids. Where they, they had go? older kids, but not many, because uh, all we had was an elementary school here. Otherwise, you had to get... So at that point, Douglas County had Douglas County High School, or yeah, maybe, Douglas County, maybe yeah. Ponderosa? No, Ponderosa wasn't built yet. And the, they all went to Castle uh, uh, Castle Rock High School, Okay. Uh, right right by Castle Rock, the old time Castle Rock down there. Uh, that they had to go there. They had a quite a long bus ride. a 45 minute drive each way yeah. the kids had to go. So they it didn't really, until we built the high school, they didn't get a lot of older children here. They had them, don't get me wrong, but not that many. Most of it was elementary school kids. Uh, right. small, so young families is what I'm basically mm -hmm. trying to say. Young, aggressive uh, families, um, pioneers, I guess. Young pioneers. I guess. <laughs> yeah, all good. So, what shall we talk about next? Oh, I don't know. We could talk about uh, just the atmosphere of the ranch back then. Uh, I remember being at a bunch of meetings together with the homeowners association. Oh, we started the homeowners association, which was really huge, in July of '82. So you had the activities committee that started in October of '81, late '81 uh -huh. at this point, which planned all the activities. Right, and. Then you had the, the metro district. started developing. Yeah, and they really started developing. We had all the fun stuff for the so kids. So where did the homeowners, on. where did the homeowners and the architectural control committees and all that stuff start coming in? That was the HRCA, Highlands Ranch Community Association. And that, that started in July of 82. We had a meeting at uh, uh, Northridge. They had a little meeting room in there. Uh, and we met, and Joe Blake did the whole presentation. And we uh, elected uh, three delegates. And we elected two people to the board. I was appointed chair of the finance committee. Joe Blake asked me if I wanted to be chair of the finance committee. And that's when the homeowner association first started. And then they, we, the homeowner association controls all the rec centers, architectural control, uh, the, you know, how your yard looks, the color of paint they have on your home and all that kind of stuff. And the Metro District was already in place and that was controlled. Mission Viejo and the HRCA when it first started had three members on it. Uh, and my brother was on it for very first. Joe Blake was on it. And I think maybe Jeff Kappas was on the Oh, Bill Helstrom with the three Mission Viejo people on the very first board of directors of the HRCA. And then uh, Barlow, I just saw his name in one of these Highlands Ranch reporters, and I forget the other person that was the two board of directors uh, at the time. And, but Mission VL worked very closely with the Homeowner Association. I mean, they controlled everything, but boy, if we said, hey, homeowners need this, Mission VL was right there. They, they are 100% behind building a community for the people uh, and a family community. But almost all the meetings I went to have Joe Blake say, you know, remember, you're, you're made, we're building a place to raise your family. And that was my whole intent. That's why I did all the stuff for the activities committee and all that. All these activities and all the schools and getting this thing going, it's just a place to raise your family. I understand that when they planned the community <coughs> earlier than 81 mm -hmm. and put together the development plan, mm -hmm. as it was called, that the finance people convinced the, the management of Mission Viejo that it made more sense to build the roads initially at full capacity, even though they wouldn't be needed in that mm -hmm. capacity for many years into the future as part of the build-out plan. Mm -hmm. And that's what happened. Well, what people used to come and visit me and we had 
Broadway with six lanes and probably with more than a hundred people living in there. <laughs> you know, right. <laughs> what are the roads doing there? But you know, the, the, the combination, all your utilities are in that in the roads too. So the Metro District put them all in and it's probably cheaper. And one thing about Mission Bay, it saved them during this downturn of the 80s is that Philip Morris pumped a bunch of money in here. I mean, they weren't shy. They knew it was going to turn around again someday. And they just said, hey, we're going to go for it. And they had the money to do it. Philip Morris is a big time operation. The thing I found interesting was that the land associated with Highlands Ranch was about twice the size of the original Mission Viejo property in California. Oh, that's a big deal. Wasn't it? And certainly it was much bigger than Mission Viejo um, Aurora. Oh no, the Mission Bay Which Road. Was just one mile just square. a small little deal. This that was, was 30, one mile square. This, this, 30, was... this is 32 square miles. Yeah. yeah that's a big this deal. This was large. A, actually, for many, many years, the village is down in Florida right now, is the largest master plan community in the United States. But for many, many years, Highlands Ranch was the mass, largest master plan community in the United States. Right. And what do you consider to be a master plan community? Well, I remember Joe Blake when I first started. And I was there two days, and Joe Blake said, Game went off says, hey, let's go, we're going to the mansion. So he got out there and he's driving down County Line Road, going up and down like this. And uh, and I'm he's having me read these things. I don't read well in the car, I'm getting sick to my stomach. <laughs> you know? Anyway, I can always remember going up and down that road. And we get to yeah, the mansion. County, County Line uh, was most people who remember that is just a, a real adventure. lane. That was an adventure. Up real and down, adventure. up and down. Yeah. And uh, anyway, we get to the mansion pulls this car looking towards the uh, uh, north and pulls out these master plans. And he's got the, Joe's got these beautiful blue eyes and he's, he's going and his eyes are like this and he's showing me all this stuff on the master plan community. This, you know, three high schools and this kind of happen over here and all that. And I kind of said to myself, you know, I, I said, this guy's a dreamer. This, this stuff like this doesn't happen. You know, master plans, you know, they're always changed because of the economy and all this right. other kind of stuff. This guy's a dreamer. And I just told him this the other day. I had lunch with him, uh, dinner with him a few months back. And, and he's going on and on about all this stuff. And, and to the most part, I would bet 95% of Highlands Ranch is followed the master plan, which is highly. But that's a, the credibility of the people that work for Mission Viejo Company and what they their reputation with the homeowners and what they wanted to build here, they, they were, you couldn't ask for a better developer. They had the money, uh, they had uh, character. I guess the character is the name of the game, trust. Everybody, mm -hmm. uh, you know, they just did everything they could to help the people here. And they did it not because, I don't think they did it for the monetary value. I think they just wanted to build a place that, you know, with a reputation. I understand that you weren't here quite at the time, but your brother was. But at the time this was announced, and eventually Mission Viejo got control of the property, there were a lot of people who were uh, against or fearful of the unknown of this large development of a California-based company coming up here and building something that would be large and certainly very different than had been built in the area before. Mm -hmm. Can you elaborate? Uh, yeah, that's true. Well, that? Douglas County. Douglas County was just a cattle town for the most part. I remember the first, county. Right when I, the first time I had to go and get my license place in Castle Rock, I felt like I just drove back to the 50s. This is 1980, an old, <laughs> a little yeah. old uh, Ford dealership. I had to go and get, they had to get the registration off, and and it's all cattle ranches in there around. There was nothing around here. You know, they had two police cars for all of Douglas County. Uh, there was nothing going on. And uh, so the people were a little afraid. Tweet Kimball, one of them. Tweet Kimball, uh, Joe Teffer, Teffer probably told you uh, all this, but she was the one, that, she was the deciding factor. She ran Douglas County at the time. And uh, I hear Bill Duncan's name quite a bit too. Yeah, Bill Duncan was the other guy. But uh, <laughs> Tweet Kimball. Teffer had, had very interesting things to say about Bill Duncan. No, yeah. Duncan. Yeah. But, he he got, said, but he said he was, <clears throat> he was tough. No, that's tough. And so was. Tweet Kimball was no no run over lady. I mean, she was a tough lady too. But I heard the story in a way. Uh, Phil Riley was sitting next to Tweet Kimball at a luncheon, 
And on a piece of paper, he showed where the development of Highlands Ranch was compared to the rest of the community, or the rest of the land they own, and Tweet Kimball's properties up here in this land as the green belt area. And she said, well, if you keep that development down here, it's okay. And actually, on that piece, of, on that napkin, on that drawing, is where Tweet Kimball agreed that go ahead with Highlands Ranch. And that there would be a backcountry buffer between her property and the development property. That was, a, that was on a napkin. <laughs> Interesting. <laughs> that was Phil Riley. And Phil Riley, yep. you might know, was the president of the sure. Trail Company. Sure. Great guy, too. All the people. And then uh, there was a guy by the name of Kevin Murphy, and his dad was the head guy for Philip Morris Company. And uh, Kevin Murphy's dad developed light beer back in Milwaukee. So he was a, and he was a, Kevin Murphy, who lived, he was a neighbor of mine, he was on the first residence too. Uh, his dad was the uh, chairman of the board, of, or senior executive, very high up, but he was in charge of Mission VL, of the division of Mission VL in Philip Morris. And his son lived out here, and Phil Riley's son lived out here. He had the very first phone number, very first phone number was 791-2001, and that was Phil Riley's son. <laughs> he had the very. He had one of the first houses in here too. He lived in Bayfield. You're aware that the Highlands Ranch Historical Society <coughs> published a book mm -hmm. here a couple of years ago. Whatever. And, uh, David Johnston, <coughs> one of our board members, uh, took the lead in developing that. Mm -hmm. So when the book was finally published, <coughs> of which that's a long process, and we committed to buying a few thousand, however many we did, mm -hmm. Paul was involved in that. At this point, we thought we would send a copy to Jim Teffer, mm -hmm. and he was very thankful for getting one. He said, but I think you should also send one to Phil Riley. <laughs> so we did. You really we me. did at this point, even though we don't know Phil as well as, mm -hmm. as we know Jim, yeah. as Jim's here and Phil's not. Yeah this point, but Phil sent us a very nice thank you and thought that the, the book was a good representation of the actual history uh -huh. and appreciated the the old pictures, uh -huh. the, uh -huh. the new pictures of what the ranch has become mm -hmm. at this point. But yeah. Phil is very complimentary of uh, our efforts there. Uh, the, and I think he's pretty happy with the way the community turned out. I don't know who wouldn't be happy. I mean, it's one of the Highlands Ranch was raised, you know, money making a few years back, one of the best places to live in the United States for a town of our side. As you know, well as Douglas County. County. Douglas County. And uh, it just doesn't get any better. The views, the piece of land. I heard the story many a time that Phil Riley came out here. Phil Riley's the one that bought the land. And Phil Riley came out here in 77 or something like that and uh, uh, got a hold of most likely uh, uh, Murphy. Kevin Murphy's dad at Mission Vale Company, I mean at Philip Morris, said, I just found the most beautiful piece of land in the United States and sent me the money for the down payment on it. And two days later, he got the down payment. And then they had a contingency, had to put the plan, you know, all, all contingent and then putting a the master plan and getting it approved and all that. Right. And so he started it. But that was, he said, I've just found the most beautiful piece of land in the United States. Mm -hmm. This is the guy that's coming from Mission Vale, California, <laughs> to develop that. So that's kind of that's a special comment. Yeah, this was a this was a bigger problem. They had a good plate to start with. Yeah, it was about twice the size, as we understand, of what they had developed in California. Yeah, yeah. So they were taking and they had the history. Of, risk. And they had the history of California of how to develop. So they came out here, and like I said, they're the activities committee, all the stuff with community and all that. And that's the same. It's the same package that proved successful in California. Yeah. Different topic would be C-470. Do you mm -hmm. have any color on how that got built or when it got built? Because that was... Well, there's a couple deals on C-470. What happened is, is Mission Bay, when they first started the ranch, knew that was vital. The county line could never... You wouldn't have any homes built here if it wasn't for just, you know, just county line. So they had to have the freeway. So they actually dedicated that piece of land. I heard the story a couple different times. Dedicated that piece of land to CDOT, and then Governor Lamb put the golden spike in it. So we're not building that road. It's going to just create development. We don't want that. And so they put the golden spike in it. And I think it was around 1984, 83, or something like that. Uh, the contract that they had to give the land to CDOT expired. And it was four months later, maybe a little different. And Joe Blake knows the total detail on that. A couple months later, CDOT came to Mission Viejo Company and said, oh, we're going to put the freeway in. Uh, you're still going to give us that land. And I said, nope. 
uh, that expired four months ago. And they weren't happy that it expired without them saying they wanted the road. But the bottom line is they got $10 million. <laughs> they paid $32 million for the property. But they paid $10 million for the right-of-way for C-470. And then they put the road in. Uh, and I, my house was affected because I could hear the road. I'm only five houses from C-470 down on Broadway. And I'm, I'm five houses now from Dad Clark. Uh, and so uh, uh, what happened is, is that uh, they put the road in. Uh, took a couple years to build, obviously. They don't stop at Ken Carroll in the very beginning. Uh, they, they didn't build the rest of it until a few years later. Uh, and so uh, the road opened up, and the day it opened up, we had a, they had a, a marathon race. People ran down to Ken Carroll and back, and that was the grand opening of the road. Uh, so that's the story behind C-470. And without C-470, uh, I know his ranch wouldn't be here today to the size it is today. That was huge. I agree. Good. Paul, do you have any questions? I've just been chewing to listen to what you guys are talking about. I didn't I didn't even think about what to ask. Gary, what else would you like to share about the early days? Well, the early days, the school system, that was huge in developing a downtown a community to raise your children. Uh, a guy by the name of O'Connell, superintendent of schools, Rick came in. Yeah. And then time. McFar McFarland was very active. Supervisor. Yeah. Uh, he, he put together the, the plans to build all the schools. We got the school bond passed and whatever. So when we started building the schools, that really changed the atmosphere. We had the rec centers, uh, the Highlands Ranch Rec Center. We had Northridge. It was really a nice rec center. We had uh, financially, it was in good shape because of home mission deal and whatever. Uh, but the schools were really keen uh, to build in a place to raise your community. Almost everybody that moved in the ranch at the time had children, uh, school age children. And so there was a couple of people, uh, Kim's, uh, the Northridge School, when it first started in October, uh, was a, like a one room schoolhouse. Uh, they only had something like, in, very, in October, something like that, 20. Designed years. for 450. Yeah. So they had, uh, what happened is they only had a couple classrooms the first year. And mm -hmm. the first, second, kindergarten, first, and second grade were all in one classroom. <laughs> I think they had three classrooms going on when it first opened up to kind of give you an idea. Uh, and then they started the PTA. Uh, Melanie Worley was involved in the first PTA. She ended up being county commissioner, and another one that started the PTA was uh, Kim Herskovitz. Who's who? Kim Herskovitz. Okay. Uh, and Kim Starks, her name today. Uh, they were the first people, and they started up the, uh, they had children in it, and they started up the PTA, uh, which is still active today. But the school system, uh, without question, I think even today, Douglas County is recognized as one of the best school systems in the United States. I think Rock Creek. Kind of give you an example was the eighth best high school in the United States a couple of years ago. I'm not sure what it is today. I don't follow schools like they did, but the school system, uh, what they put together here is really something. I remember we went out. I think I was on the board of directors of the uh, HRCA after I became a delegate. I was head of the finance committee for tw you know 12 years. I, I was on that till '92, from '82, and then uh, uh, then I was a delegate. Now I was on the HRCA board for. A couple years and uh, so I got invited to take the first shovel of dirt at the new high school and, and Joe Blake and I are out there with a spring day and they had a this huge This is what became Highlands Ranch, High, 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 High Ranch High School. Mm -hmm. They had a little trailer out there and they had a picture of they had a mock-up of it in this old you know construction trailer and we're all in there having a little party and uh, it rained while we were in there so they had to get tow trucks to tow all the cars out. So Joe Blake and I and I think Pam Allen and a couple of other people, Jim Tepford most likely was there I uh, took the first shovel of dirt for the new uh, high school. And that, that was a beautiful high school. I remember walking through that when it first opened. They did a beautiful job. O'Connell, uh, he uh, he did a good job of building schools. He, it, people thought he had a little bit of an ego, but uh, uh, the bottom line is he, he built quality, and today they're still there. They're still beautiful schools. I mm -hmm. think they had mahogany windows in this high school. You know, I go, wow, that's really something. <laughs> <laughs> but there, but there are their first class packages. I drive by them all the time today when I go golfing over at the Lynx Golf Course over there, and uh, uh, this, this is a nice package. Well, the high school is nothing without a road to get there. No, well, they had to put in the so roads. The roads started coming. Lincoln. The metro district put in all the roads, as you know. So then we turn them over. They had to build Lincoln to get yeah. to the high school. And Lincoln, when they first opened it up, did not put it. They only put it two lanes. So they had to they had to open up Lincoln to get the kids from Lone Tree over. It wasn't Lone Tree back then; it was just unincorporated Douglas County. But they had, 
Lincoln for many years is just uh, they had a little area there between Lone Tree and Highlands Ranch. They left that a two lane road for many years. Mm -hmm. And they had a huge problem first opening up because everybody was hitting deer. I remember playing golf at the Lynx Golf Course in the 80s. And the Lynx Golf Course opened up in 85. They, had a, they only had opened and up Glen Eagles holes. Village along with it. What's that? Yeah, and the village. Glen, Glen Eagles Village. Yeah, Glen Eagles opened up right around the same time. And then the only big change they had in the master plan, Palomino Park, which was the apartments there today with the condos, that was going to be a big office complex like Inverness. I heard that. Yeah, mm -hmm. and then that the market was just never here for the office complex type stuff. They sold that off to Palomino Park. But uh, yeah, they opened up in 85. I remember uh, they had a shotgun start. I went to the grand opening. I was golfing with Art Cook, as a matter of fact. Art Cook shows up. He wasn't a golfer, so he shows up with uh, some golf clubs. And a hefty golf and a hefty garbage bag. <laughs> okay. <laughs> but anyway, they had the first nine holes, and we had the grand opening at the golf course with a shotgun start. Kind of fun. There you go. Uh, that's good. But uh, so the schools are the big deal. Uh, building the community, the parks, the recs, the kids, the activities for the kids to do, and even still today, it's one of the best places in the island, you know, in the country to raise your family. And that was always the goal of Mission Vale Company, uh, to uh, be a place to raise your family. Although now, there's a lot more emphasis on stuff for the older people. <laughs> the community's lot, changed. You know, the community's changed over the years. Well, it was a great place. We've all got started. older. There's a yeah. higher percentage of seniors here. So there's more emphasis on yeah. senior clubs and senior activities now. So it was a big deal. So the ranch, uh, it developed as planned. Uh, Mission Vale and uh, Philip Morris did a great job putting it all together. Philip Morris, uh, they did not squibble and give you needed a couple dollars to do this and that. Uh, whenever you did something at the Highlands Ranch and the different meetings that I was at, because I was on the board of directors of the Metro District for eight years too, and they put in all the parks and they run the parks and all the rest of the stuff. And every time you go and do something, it's a first class deal. And Joe Blake was a lot behind that, the same with Tefford. And if you're going to do something, I guess. The old saying, if you're going to do something, do it right. And that was Highlands Ranch. If you're going to do something, don't cut corners and make, and that's the whole idea of having uh, cement in the roads. You know, very few communities would ever want to put that money into putting that cement into the roads. But it's in our ordinances here that all major roadways have to be cement. And that's why C-470 for the longest time was cement. And it's being cemented again today because it's in the best part of Highlands Ranch. So it was all first class all the way. And the homeowners... Uh, they got the benefit of that, especially in the 80s. It was like a country club out here. It, was, it had all this stuff out here for all these people, and it wasn't very crowded. And uh, so you can just go to the rec center and didn't have to worry about standing in line for anything. And all the activities really brought the community together. You know, my, I, we go to the July 4th, and my kids are playing with other kids, and they know they're all having fun. And the sports programs, I was involved in the sports program, first-class sports programs all along the line. We went with Douglas... County soccer, which was huge. We went with the, for baseball, we went with the Warriors League over here. And then the Metro District put together the football program. Uh, so they've always had great sports programs here and some really good teams over the years, too. But uh, I remember coaching back in the early 80s, you know, and uh, the very first soccer team I coached, there wasn't enough boys on it, if you can believe this. It was my son was in the first and second, first grade, maybe the second grade. They couldn't find anybody to coach the uh, uh, team, so they came to me, and I didn't know anything about soccer. But there was not enough boys on the team. Northridge is the only school built here. So I had four girls and eight guys on the team. <laughs> and just at the last at historical committee last week, I met the parents, of one of the girls that are on my soccer team. <laughs> and uh, they're there, and we we're talking about it. There wasn't enough boys to be on the very first team. Uh, so, but the, the sports programs we put together here over the years are really special. Uh, it was, uh, you know, the Heritage Park, they put that together. And yeah, Mission Vail, they uh, and uh, Philip Morris, they, they chipped in money when you needed to do these things, you know. There wasn't enough money out here to build some of these things. Uh, and they said, well, no, we want to do it right. Let's go ahead and do that. So, yeah, that was huge. And so, as far as Highlands Ranch, the whole thing that we want to build a place to raise your family, they did it, uh, you know, uh, the best of their ability, and it turned out, in my opinion, uh, exactly the way it should be. Do you have any color on the eventual sale of the undeveloped properties from 
Monsieur the Ed or the Shea. Shea's done a great job. And a lot of the people at Shea are still the old people I knew. A lot of the people at Shea are still the people that were there in the 80s when I was at, uh, uh, at Mission Vale County. Mission Vale, Shea came in and did a tremendous job. Actually, they, they did a favor. Their, the houses at the time, we were selling houses to different builders. The quality wasn't there, and everybody could see the difference in the quality between a Mission Vale home and some of the other builders that they're allowing into the ranch. Uh, but they were selling lots and were building homes so everybody's happy. And the first thing Shea did when they came in is they wanted to change that. They took over all the building. They kicked all of well, most of the other builders out. And they built a really good product. Uh, and they, you know, uh, you, you can see it today. It's the stuff that Shea's done. Shea's been a great developer, too. Another deep pocket people. And you never look, lost the continuity because they hired all the people from Mission Bay Company. Mm -hmm. They took over the whole operation. So anybody that was a Mission Bale company when Shea came in had a job, and they're still there today. Most of the people at Shea Homes are ex-Mission Bale people, mm -hmm. and they just did a tremendous job. And they just kept the continuing uh, the uh, the initial goal of what they're going to build. Good. Okay, well, I think we're out of time here. Okay. We'll give you the last word. Well, anything been, you, anything a, you'd like to say. Now it's been a fun ride living here in Highlands Ranch. Mm -hmm. I look at my lifestyle, and uh, I say, wow. Well, you know, uh, that kind of show that I talk about sometimes, but uh, what my children enjoyed. Yeah. yeah. Your daughter still live here? No, my daughter lives in Walsh Park. My son lives in City Park. Kind mm -hmm. of a, but what they enjoyed, and the, the, the way they're raised, and the, how they turned out, a lot of it had to do with where we lived, their mm -hmm. friends and the community. And that's all because of Shea Homes and Mission VL Company and uh, those people, they... Uh, there was a lot to that. The school, the education my kids got when they went to college, they went to CU, uh, along with not only my kids, but the other kids from Highlands Ranch. Uh, my son told me, boy, Dad, you know, we're head over heels. Some of the other kids at CU from Colorado here as far as what we learned in high school. And so that whole education system and whatever uh, developed some very, some very good kids were developed in Highlands Ranch because of the vision of Mission Vale Company. Yep. Because so. Okay, well, on behalf of the Historical Society and Paul McKeegan and myself, we wanted to thank you for sharing your thoughts today. Well, thank you for letting That's me share them because uh, yeah. it's huge. I look at all these old reporters here and that, and I go, wow, this is, there is a real good story here. Been a trip. Mm -hmm. yeah. So thanks again. Yeah.